Insurance brokers and agents love to try and portray themselves as a glorified financial planner or some architect in your overall financial well-being, but I'm going to let you guys in on a little bit of a secret. At the end of the day, insurance brokers and agents are basically just glorified salesmen and they get paid based upon how much premium they sell to you. And so in this video, I'm going to go over the top five lies that I think insurance brokers and agents tell to you to try and get a bigger commission. What is up, guys? For those of you new to the channel, my name is Philip Sutter. I'm the founder and CEO of Affinity Life, where we've helped thousands of Canadians find the right life insurance coverage at the right price, all from the comfort of their own home. So if that sounds interesting, and I'll put a link in the description below and you can check it out. But without further ado, let's get right into the video. So before we get started, I'm just going to say right now, I know this video is probably going to piss off a lot of other insurance brokers and a lot of other insurance agents that are in this industry. And they probably believe a lot of these lies that I'm about to tell you. And so, hey, listen, if you're watching this and you disagree with me, put a comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts and I'd love to see why you disagree with me. But let's just get into it, starting with number one, which is term life insurance is a waste of money. So I just got into a conversation the other day. I had a very old friend reach out to me. I've known this guy for like 15 years and he reached out to me and he said, hey, Phil, uh, you know what? I'm starting to look for life insurance. And I remember you got into life insurance industry like 10 years ago and I have a partner now and we just had kids and I'm looking to get some life insurance. I said, oh, great. OK, go to my website. You know, you can look up quotes instantly. You can get a term 10 or a term 20 or a term 30, whatever you're looking for. It's going to be like 30 or 50 bucks a month. Get like half a million or a million and go on your way. And this guy kept coming back to me, said, oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm thinking of getting a whole life insurance policy. Uh, I don't want to waste my premiums on term life insurance. And I was like, think I'm like, what? Like, where, who who are you talking to that like you think this is a good idea? And he's like, oh, I've been watching a bunch of videos and, you know, I'm looking at it. You can use whole life for this. And of course, you know, why would I, I don't want to pay the premiums? And then, of course, if I don't die, it's a giant waste of money. And so here's the thing. If you think about it. You pay for auto insurance every month. You pay for home insurance every month if you own a home. You pay for all these other different types of insurance, maybe liability insurance, and you never get to the end of your term or you get to the end of the insurance. You know, you sell your vehicle and you think like, damn, I didn't get into a car accident. I really wish I would have gotten like a really bad spinal injury so I could use my insurance and I'd make it feel worthwhile. Term life insurance is only meant to cover you for a specific period of time and its inexpensive premiums reflect that. And so one of the big sales pitches of some other insurance agents is say, well, listen, you know, if you're going to pay the premiums, you might as well pay the premiums into some type of permanent life insurance plan because then you're not wasting it. And eventually you're going to get that death benefit down the road. And I ran a few different numbers here for you. This, by the way, this is just some quick numbers that I ran. Of course, I could get super in depth with illustrations, and everything, but I just wanted to give you a quick example of why this is not a good idea for the vast majority of Canadians. So I took a 35 year old healthy male and I gave two different examples here. One that's going to buy term life insurance for 30 years and they're going to invest the rest into just a standard 6% returning investment in their TFSA, their tax free savings account. And this is really important because all the returns in there are tax free and also the distributions from that go to your children tax free. It's all tax free very similar to a life insurance policy, which is the main pitch of these insurance agents. So in the example, I have a 35 year old male here. He gets a million dollars of uh, term life insurance for a term 30. So he has it from age 35 to 65. He's paying $103.95 a month for that policy. That's with RBC insurance. You can get the quote from my website and apply uh, online within 10 minutes or less www.affinitylife.ca. Here's a little shameless plug. Anyways, he's paying 1247 a year for that policy. So he's going to pay over a 30 year period, $37,422 total. Now you're starting to think, oh wow, that's a lot of money that he's paying, 37,000, that is a waste of money. Let me tell you what he does though, however, he is gonna put $10,000 a year into a TFSA for 10 years, then he's gonna stop putting anything into that. He's gonna do that at earning 6% average for the duration of his life, of course it's gonna go up and it's gonna go down, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, a couple things here. So at age 65, he's got a balance in that portfolio of $480,000. Now, why did I put 65? Because the term life insurance, we're going to cancel that at 65. We're no longer using that, okay? And by the way, I'm just comparing this purely from a death benefit point of view. I'm not going to get into the investment. I will talk about that in the next point, but it does get more complicated and you're going to find out why. So at age 65, his term life insurance is done. We cancel that. He's got just under half a million dollars in a TFSA. 
He continues to invest that and he doesn't withdraw it because remember, we're just comparing death benefit for this example. At age 85, he's got 1.539936. So, you know, $1.5 million basically in that account that goes to his children tax free. Let's compare that to a whole life insurance plan where you, again, put $10,000 a year into a whole life insurance policy. You do that for 10 years and then you stop. The starting face amount of that whole life is going to be $202,000. So we're roughly the one fifth of what we got originally, the million dollars what we got in the term. Now this is only 200. So if you did pass away in that 30 year period, you're going to be, you know, a little bit underinsured. You're not going to give as much to your family. Um, you know, it's not going to be the same amount as a million dollars. Um, that's the starting thing. Number one, the starting amount is not going to be as large as the term life insurance. And number two, if we go now at 65, the death benefit for that, remember the death benefit in the TFSA, what we would leave to our children would be 480. In the life insurance, it's 580. So it does start to edge out a little bit in this regard. So at age 65, you would cancel the term life insurance and you'd be in 100,000 deficit. However, what happened? You actually did live a long and healthy life and you died at the age of mortality, which I put at age 85. The life insurance would be 1.176 million. So with the TFSA, we'll have 1.5 and with the life insurance policy, we'll have 1.17. So almost $330,000 difference. Now, of course, you would need to subtract the 37,000 that we paid for the term life insurance, but you can see with the TFSA, not only would you not be locked into this policy and you could stop paying the premiums, or not the premiums, but you could stop paying into it at any given year and your policy wouldn't collapse. Not only could you withdraw it without having to pay penalties and policy loans and fees and potentially taxes, but you would have more benefit. You'd have an extra $300,000 that would be a net death benefit to your children. So when advisors say that, hey, term life insurance is a waste of money, I don't know if they're running the numbers because you can clearly see that it's not. Now, I will say this all with a caveat. This is done in a TFSA. If you needed to compare this to a non-registered account, and I always say this in my channel, that this might be a good idea for wealthy Canadians and for business owners because there's a few unique tax differences that work in a corporation, it could be a good idea. But you can see here for the vast majority of Canadians that haven't maxed out their traditional accounts, just investing in your RSP or TFSA is probably going to be the best option for you. Which leads me to point number two or lie number two where advisors love to try and sell you on a bigger policy and that's investing in life insurance is a good idea. Now, I'm not going to get super in depth into this because I made a number of different videos on my channel. One is specifically on infinite banking, but others comparing it to a TFSA and an RSP and you'll see in all these different examples, an RSP and a TFSA is way more simple, there's way less strings attached, and there's gonna have more benefit at the end of the day for the majority of Canadians. Again, for the minority of Canadians that are in a very high tax bracket or they're in a business that's making a lot of money and the business could own the insurance, there's some special tax consequences that go along with that, but for the majority of Canadians, this is a bad idea. There's so many strings attached. If you don't pay your premiums in certain years, you may collapse your policy. And then again, access to the cash, it isn't immediate. You either need to take a policy loan, a collateral loan, or a surrender of your policy. And some of those have tax consequences here in Canada that go along with it that make this entire strategy obsolete because then you're paying tax and interest to access your money and it's just not going to be the best idea for you at the end of the day. And by the way, if you want to watch any of these other videos that I made specifically comparing this strategy to an RSP or a TFSA, just comment below and ask for the RSP comparison or the TFSA comparison and the infinite banking video. If you look it up on my channel, I think it's actually one of my most watched videos on the channel. So you can go ahead and I think it's like a 35 minute video that really gets into the nitty gritty of how this works. But just know for the vast majority of Canadians, this is not the best idea. You should focus on your other registered accounts first and probably just get a term life insurance policy. Number three, you don't have enough coverage. You need to buy more coverage to protect your family. Now, I'm going to say this all with a caveat at the end of the day, because here's the thing. Of course, we should try and get as much coverage as we can to protect our family. But I hear this a lot from advisors that they'll look at a client, they'll look at the financial situation, they'll look at the picture. And I'll probably get a lot of flack about this one specifically from other advisors, because of course, we're trying to ensure our clients. Here's the thing at the end of the day, I have a calculator on my website. You can go to other websites and take a calculator and it might determine that based upon your 
income and your debt and your mortgage and your financial picture and what you want to save for your children and all these other different variables, you need two and a half million dollars. However, once you run a quote for two and a half million dollars, you say, hey, Philip, listen, you know, that's going to be two hundred and twenty five dollars a month for that policy or whatever it is. It just seems it's a little bit out of my price range and I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that. And I say, hey, great. Okay. Why don't we, instead of focusing on the face amount, why don't we focus on an amount that you can afford? Why don't we pick a premium that you can pay every month? You're comfortable paying and and you're not going to be looking at that thing in, you know, three to five years and you haven't passed away and you're thinking, yeah, maybe I should cancel that. You know, like I, I haven't died yet. So maybe I'll just get rid of this policy and save some money. And then you do that. And in year six, you pass away. So yes, it is important, you know, to get as much coverage as you can, but I'm speaking from experience. At the end of the day, if you do pass away, something will always be better than nothing. And if any advisor is trying to sell you on a big, you know, whatever term life insurance, even if it's term life insurance, but it's a big face amount and the premium just seems a little bit too uncomfortable for you, it's going to be way better to just pick an amount, a premium amount that you're comfortable with. And even if it's slightly less than you say you need, it's better to have something than nothing. Number four, you should buy life insurance on your children. This one I hear again, quite a bit from other advisors. Once they've run out of the uh, buy life insurance and permanent life insurance on yourself, they're going to look for an additional place to try and sell some whole life insurance. And again, I've made other videos on this, but here's the pitch is you can buy a whole life insurance product on your child and then they'll have this, you know, death benefit, whatever it is. So if they did pass away, you would get a small amount, whatever it is, 50,000, 100,000. And then at age 18, 19 or 20, you can then gift them this policy and they have this cash surrender value aspect of it, this equity within that whole life insurance policy that they can borrow against and they can start their own business. They can buy a car or they can use it to go to university. Now, again, I'll say this with a caveat, for the majority of Canadians, this is probably not a good idea. Number one, you can look at the investments again. If you haven't maxed out your RSP or your TFSA, you don't have your own term life insurance. And at that point, maybe even your own permanent life insurance option. This isn't something that I would recommend looking at. And another thing too, if you want to save for your children's education and our ESP, not only is it a tax deferred investment account, but the government also will put in grants up to a certain amount where you get free money into this account. So if you haven't already done all of those other things, this is probably not going to be a good idea for you. And again, you're probably wasting your money. There's much better places you can put your money. But if you are in that minority, minority group where you have your own term life insurance, you've maxed out your RSP, you've maxed out your TFSA, you have no outstanding debt, maybe you have your own permanent life insurance plan, you max out the RESP on your children and you're looking for an additional source, you're just flush with cash, this could be a good idea. But for the vast majority of Canadians that I've seen that have bought this on their children, they're not in that group. And what I found, this is just an additional way for advisors to make money off of you. Which leads me to the last point, which is number five. You should buy life insurance when you're young to quote unquote lock in the rates. So this answers the question. Well, how do I sell life insurance to someone who doesn't quite need life insurance yet? There's two ways that advisors can do this. The first way we've talked about before is where you turn life insurance into an investment, quote unquote, and they say, well, not everybody needs life insurance, but everyone needs an investment. So you should buy a whole life or a universal life and quote unquote, you can use it later on down the road, blah, 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 make some investments, yada, yada, yada. I've already debunked this. If you haven't maxed out your other accounts, it's probably not a good idea. That's one way that they sell life insurance to people who don't need life insurance. The other way is they sell it when they're young, they're healthy, they don't have a partner, they don't have financial responsibilities, they don't need life insurance. So then they come up with this, well, you should buy to lock in your rates. So let's go through this here. If you have an average 20 year old who's healthy, nothing's wrong with them, you know, they're going through life, they're not married, they don't have children, they don't have any financial responsibilities, why would they buy life insurance? That's like being 10 years old and saying, well, I should buy auto insurance because I wanna lock in my rates now so when I'm 20 and I buy a car, I'll have it. No, no, no. Just wait until you're 20 and you buy the car and then buy auto insurance. Same with that 20 year old. Just wait until you have financial responsibilities and maybe you already have them. Maybe you have a family and you, you're married, you have children. 
absolutely, then get it. But if you don't have that need, wait until you have that need, whether it's at age 25, 30, 35, or 40, and then purchase it. Because here's the thing, for a 20 year old up until age 30, the premiums are actually almost identical. You're not saving any money because insurance companies understand that, you know, when you're 20 to 30, you're still young, you're still figuring out life. Accidents can and do happen statistically in that range. Usually it's around age 30 that you start to settle down, have a family, you know, get married, you know, the responsibilities start to stack up and the accidents become less frequent. So the, the, the price in, pardon me, from age 20 to age 30 is very minimal and then sometimes can actually be cheaper for the 30 year old. So it doesn't make sense for you to buy life insurance at that age. Now, one of the main reasons advisors will try and sell this is they say you might come up with some type of health condition later on down the road that prevents you from getting life insurance. Now, I'll say all this with a caveat, they're not wrong in that sense. If you do get some type of health condition later on in life that may prevent you from getting preferential rates, obviously that's not a good thing, but only you know you. And if you're a healthy, you know, otherwise healthy individual that doesn't have any hereditary illnesses that run in the family, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say you're probably gonna be fine. However, maybe if you are an unhealthy individual and you don't see yourself changing those habits in the future, it could be a good idea. However, I still do think for the vast majority of Canadians, it doesn't make sense to lock in your rate. Just wait until you have a need for life insurance and then purchase it at that point. So with all that being said, I hope that you guys enjoyed today's videos. If you guys have any questions, comments, as usual, just drop them below. And if you guys are enjoying this content, all I ask is you give it a thumbs up and I'll see you guys in the next one.